So my name is Wei Yuan, I'm from, as mentioned, I'm from Rockadam Vicky. And arguably, I'm going to say like, probably this could go very well or very bad because trigonometry, I'm not sure uh, what your memories are of trigonometry back in, let's say, high school or secondary school. Uh, so yeah, trigonometry in SES and what did I learn in implementing? What, what was our motivation in doing this in the first place? Okay, so behind every solution, there's some problem that we face. So this was my problem. Designers come down and tell us, please do this animation in one of our app, uh, web applications. Okay. So just to be clear, this is already deployed. We have a solution currently is in one of our applications called Sumpi. Okay. Okay. So before I go into the, our actual approach, let me just talk about a few approaches that we eliminated that we do not use, you know, for solving this problem. So one of the most easiest things to do, you know, you want to do an animation like this, create a GIF, load it in a web page. But what's the problem? Okay, you can see, very big size, 97.5 kilobytes. It's not exactly scalable. You, uh, you load this in a web application, let's say you have 10 animations you want to load. Essentially, it's one megabyte. You have mobile users in your site, you're not being generous to them. You know, essentially, you're eating up their bandwidth for just loading a site. Okay, so not exactly a good solution. Okay, how about using something that's more elegant? So some of you all might have heard of this thing called Lotte Files. So it's this uh, library that's created, or series of libraries created by Airbnb, uh, where you can create a JSON file uh, that has this animation information encoded in. And what you do is you load this uh, library within your web application, uh, load this JSON file, and essentially you can render the entire animation out. Okay, so it's quite useful because it not only has a JavaScript library, it also has this Android client uh, library as well as some iOS library. And it means that your designers can just do the work once and share it across all three different clients. Okay? Uh, and the good thing is this, for a JSON file, I found out that when we transformed this to a JSON file, it was just two kilobytes. So as compared to previous, uh, the previous solution of a GIF is around 98 kilobytes. You know, you see, it's, a, it's clearly night and day you know, difference. Okay? But there's another problem here. You know, again, I'm going to talk about scaling because you know, previously we talked about if you're going to use a multi multitude of images or GIFs for loading. In our case here, we're trying to solve the problem for only one single animation. And you can see over here, loading the minified library is around 58 kilobytes. So you add that to your JSON, that's 60 kilobytes. Uh, somewhere around the same price that you pay for uh, loading a GIF. So not exactly the price we want to pay if you just want to load one single animation. Okay, so on to the actual solution, you know, what we exactly did. Uh, in drawing that animation in CSS. Uh, but firstly, just to call back to the previous solutions, uh, we managed to draw all the hexagons, the animation itself, uh, and perform the entire, the properties required for the animation. And the total price we paid was only 1.4 kilobytes. Not bad. Okay, but it's not as smooth sailing. We end up with this situation first. Okay. And the issue is because uh, the height of the hexagon is not equivalent to the side of a hexagon. So one of my key problems when I first uh, implemented this solution was that I start off with a square. So you know for a square, you have four sides, height is equivalent to width. But then you change it to six sides, shit, it's not the same anymore. <laughs> so you have to do something about this. And there's a few solutions you can do to sort of resolve this. You know, maybe you can do some form of computation or guess and check. Uh, guess and check until you get the final, the right length uh, for let's say this site's over here, input it into your style sheets, and essentially you should get a solution. But you know, we're all engineers here. Uh, you know, we want to automate the process of getting this uh, length, you know, without having to do this entire manual process. And you know, as engineers, sometimes you have your designers or product managers, you know, they'll come to you and say, you know, this size doesn't look right. Can you make it like 5% bigger? And then, you know, we have four hexagons that I need to draw. You know, we do the whole process again. It's like, it's horrible. So, so how do you automate it? Okay, one of the earlier things that we look at is, okay, if you want to create some sort of computation uh, function, right, why not use something like SES? Okay, you can create functions, put in some input, and generate some output for that. So the input itself uh, would be the height of a hexagon, and we can assume that you know, there will be some logic, some formula that you put in there to get the, uh, the side of a hexagon. Okay, and so into the more mathematical part, <laughs> So you have a hexagon, uh, you break it down, you can see there's a right-angled triangle. So lo and behold, trigonometry, yeah, you can start with something about that. So uh, I'm not sure if uh, anyone is familiar with this thing. So I, I guess, I'm not sure if this is a Singapore thing, uh, but you have our math teachers 
usually drilling us with this thing called Tuakaso, which is essentially a representation of the tangent, cosine, and sine functions. Uh, but I'm not going to jump into the math itself. It's, I'm not a math teacher. I probably wouldn't do a good job doing this. Uh, but the general outline of this whole thing is that uh, essentially you can use the tangent formula to get the final answer. Because what happens is that uh, by manipulating the tangent formula, you'll get this uh, formula over here, which is uh, computing the length of O using the uh, tangent of 30 degree, which is the adjacent angle over here, which we know, and also multiplying with the side uh, A, which is, again, this is just half of the height. Uh, over here. So we have all the properties that we need to create this function. And uh, O itself, essentially, the output, you just multiply by 2, you should get the final solution that we want. Okay. But actually, it turns out that there's another interesting thing here, which is to implement tangent, you can actually uh, implement, you need to implement the sine function as well as the cosine function in order to compute that. And to implement cosine, you actually have to implement the sine function. So it turns out, instead of implementing just tangent, you have to implement all three functions. But here's the thing. You're using functions. So why not implement a bit of, uh, use an engineering principle, code we use. So you implement the sine function first, then you use the sine function to create a cosine function, and then use both of these functions to create a tangent function. Okay? So, more math. <laughs> oh, sh oh, this slice in the middle is it's not easy to see. Oh, darn it. Let me make this a little bit higher, so there's, there's some minus like symbols and all that. Ah, okay, much better. Okay, the idea is that, okay, so this is, for those who are not familiar with this, um, this is called the Taylor series expansion. Um, I'm not sure how to explain this properly because I'm probably not like, uh, have the expertise to explain this. The idea is that you just have this formula. You have to uh, submit it from zero to infinity where you get this uh, formula over here. Once you sum in the infinity, you should get the final solution uh, for whatever input that you put in uh, for this sine function. Okay, so in breaking this down into a formula, uh, you can look at uh, breaking down this problem into more smaller bite-sized portion. For example, you have this factorial over here. Can we create a factorial function? You have this uh, x cubed x to the power of five. We can create some form of power function for that as well. Okay, so okay. Creating a factorial function is very simple. Just create a loop, iterate on the values all the way until some terminating value, okay? And then you'll get the value uh, that you want. Uh, but we made a small optimization here, which is, so if you see over here, you start off with three factorial, and then you go on to five factorial. And then as the formula goes on, it's seven factorial, nine factorial, 11 factorial. So the idea here is that, essentially, I could just compute the value of five factorial from three factorial, you know, from a previous iteration, by just taking the value of three factorial, multiply by four and five. And essentially, we made the function be able to accept prior values. So by doing this, we reduce the runtime from n squared down to n. Okay, and you can do the same for power as well. Uh, and yeah, again, sine function. So it's kind of long. Um, it's kind of small as well. But essentially, the idea is that the main uh, logic is within line 29 and 37. I'll share this code later, uh, so don't worry about this. Uh, but basically, the main logic of this algorithm over here is to represent this uh, function, this formula over here, iterating multiple times and summating all the values together. Um, there's also a lot of things on top, but it's basic optimization on assumptions you can make on the sine function. For example, sine of zero has a value, whole number value of zero. Sine of 90 degrees has a whole value, uh, return value of one. So you can just make those assumptions and return right away if your input uh, correspond to that value. And yeah, so, Another thing to note here is that I have this loop over here. Uh, just like I mentioned, the formula is supposed to, you're supposed to sum it up to infinity. Of course, if you're writing a script, you can't really like iterate it in finite times. So we, I have this uh, variable over here, sign iteration. It's actually the value that we have today is 10. So what we found out was that uh, if you sum this up to the 10th iteration, the 11th iteration is essentially uh, a value that is believe, 10 to the power of negative 18 or 19 percent of a deviation from the final answer. So unless if you have a monitor that's huge enough to actually see the error, right, or rather the small difference, right, it's essentially a very good approximation, you know, to the, the final answer that you want. Okay. So we are done with a sign, as mentioned, code we use. Just use a sign function, very simple cosine implementation, and tangent. Yeah, so we are done. So finally, we get to this point. Okay, I'm just going to... Yep, so essentially, yeah, man being managed to uh, recreate the animation uh, that we want entirely in CSS, okay? So, 
almost, uh, if we come to this point, you might be thinking, okay, this should be the end of my talk. Uh, but truth be told, it's actually, there's still one more problem. Okay, let me. So, to be honest with all of you, uh, I, when I was creating this demonstration or this presentation, uh, I wanted to challenge myself, you know, recreate all the functions that I wrote in the code base uh, of Supi before. But of course, you know, as an engineer in my company, I can't just copy and paste the code out. So I will rewrite a lot of things. And when I was rewriting it, I actually made some mistakes with my sign function, you know, implementation of this sign function. There were some bugs in there. So I debug it, I fixed it. But then something occurred in my mind. I was thinking about, you know, if errors can occur in your functions or mix-ins for your uh, SAS code, uh, you know, why don't we treat it the same way as you know, our front-end JavaScript code or back-end code as well? You know, why don't we do things like unit tests? <laughs> Crazy. Okay, so turns out the internet is a very interesting place. You search it up, you can find a lot of interesting things. And one of these things is this library called True. Uh, it's created by this organization called Oddbird. Uh, what they promise is you can write your test in SAS uh, and report it with test runners like Mocha. So I went ahead, I did it. I write a factorial a test over here. You can see I'm making an assertion uh, for some factorial function, calculating uh, 10 factorial and com uh, comparing against some final value. Okay. And so yeah, it turns out it worked. Uh, you can see over here, this is the, from the CLI, uh, basically running the test itself, I'm able to get like all the success or failures of each of these test results. Uh, I can, so this one, I'm actually using Jess as my test runner. Uh, what you can do is you need a shim file that you can include within your project to integrate uh, this true library uh, along with a test runner, Jest. Okay. Okay. So yeah, what's the lessons that I learned from this? Uh, just to be very clear with all of you all, uh, my message that I'm trying to drive today is not to ask you all to go and implement your own trigonometry functions. Uh, please don't do that. There's libraries out there. There's like some articles out there that probably did it better than me. Uh, the point I'm trying to drive over here is by looking into implementing something using SAS, creating functions uh, or mix-ins, taking this logic in, we sort of elevate uh, CSS from a style sheet language into something that's closer to a programming language. And by doing that, you can actually start applying engineering principles on top of it. You know, one thing that we talked about, code reuse, you know, using a factorial function, reusing the implementation, the sine function, then the cosine, then the tangent. And then another lesson that I saw take away from that is the unit testing itself, you know, sort of quality control. You don't think about things like quality control on your CSS because it's something that you visualize. It's something that, you know, it's UI UX, you know, it's, you have to visualize and see if it works out. But in cases where you are writing functions or mixins, these are logic. So these are things that you need to guard against, like in the future, if someone writes in some new logic, it should still work according to the initial specifications you put in in the past. So yep, those are the lessons. And basically, I've reached the end of this. So as Beijing mentioned, we are hiring and looking for people. So if you are looking for any of these positions, you can go email her. <laughs> yeah. For a few more seconds, okay. <laughs> oh, okay, so you are more. Uh, if you're interested in the code examples or some of the like the Jazz project that I mentioned earlier on, like I have a project that I've put on GitHub. Uh, you can take a look at that um, from the Medium article that I have over here. So yeah, that's the end of this. So, yes. Hello, uh, applause. Oh, no.